This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, a conversation about the vinyl LP with Travis Elbro, author of The Vinyl Countdown, the album from LP to iPod and back again. It's the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. Last year, journalist Travis Elbro published The Long Player Goodbye, a cultural and technological history of the vinyl LP. That was on the other side of the pond, though. This year, it's newly released stateside as The Vinyl Countdown, the album from LP to iPod and back again. Travis, welcome to the program. Thank you. While reading the book at the very end and also on the back, there's excerpted from a Wired trend piece a line that says vinyl may be the final nail in the CD's coffin. And that's something I've been reading for a while, that the CDs are going out the door and vinyl is sticking around to a surprising degree. And I thought to myself, wait, that can't be right. But then I realized my own purchasing habits were divided equally between digital files purchased off of iTunes and vinyl. And I have to ask, as in your capacity as a music journalist, do you know, I mean, of course there's love for vinyl, of course there's love for cassette tapes in certain generations of, of hip-hop fandom. Has anybody ever loved the compact disc? <laughs> That's a very good question. I mean, I think the most extraordinary thing about the CDs, when you dig back into the history, was that it was sold to us uh, in much the same way as the, sort of the vinyl LP was, in a way that it was you know, it sounded better, it lasted longer, it was more durable, you got mu- more music for your money. Um, so, I mean, I, I, clearly people did. I, I can remember, my, you know, being shown them, you know, in, uh, in a, a hi-fi shop in, in England and, you know, being sort of amazed by these sort of small, solidity discs. But I think uh, as far as just a kind of an oral experience uh, and, you know, as objects, I don't think they were ever, ever as loved in quite the same way, I have to say. I mean, I think... Um, just that sort of, you know, I think, you know, CDs, the sound on them was, you know, I think the comparison I make in the book is, you know, where it's a bit like, you know, you have a dinner in, uh, by candlelight with a, uh, with a vinyl record, whereas, you know, having um, a CD, uh, you know, might have the same meal, but if, if it's done in like a strip-lit kitchen, uh, the sort of harshness of it all is a bit kind of uh, too jarring. Really. <laughs> yes, I liked that comparison in the book. It's This brings to mind, when I try to describe when I grew up in the early 1990s, that setting to, say, a 12-year-old today. Yeah. They, 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 I tell them, oh, there were only CDs, vinyl was kind of not around, and first of all, they get confused because 12-year-olds know vinyl, and then, you know, you'll say things like like Apple computer meant piece of junk back then. It's, it's, it's funny how much how much things have changed in that short span of time, in many ways, by going back to how they were before. I mean, you know, for example, Apple computers, like I just said, used to be quite good, and then they were bad, just as vinyl was quite popular. Then not so much. Now, how, how's it doing today? Well, I mean, we, we are, I mean, vinyl, I, I mean, we're in, in the, you know, a, a sort of, in a sense, of a vinyl revival. I think some, that's, a, a, in a way, a kind of direct, direct reaction to the sort of semi-disposability of music that, you know, iTunes and downloading uh, and so on brought into the equation in a way where, you know, what, I mean, we were in a way, we were kind of given this great sort of, you know, this liberty now with the internet not to have to bother with the kind of physical objects. And, and obviously we're, we're at this kind of interesting, well, you know, to use uh, the phrase, you know, the tipping point in a way that, uh, you know, a generation that's about to come up will not have grown up with the kind of physical objects of music and will only know it through sort of, you know, the, uh, the internet and downloading and so on, you know, as this like the abstract thing, which obviously, you know, curiously, almost brings us back to sort of, you know, the era of the radio in the 1930s, where you would, you know, spin your dial, or in the 1950s, even with kind of rock and roll first being kind of disseminated largely on transistor radios, as well as seven-inch singles. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're at an interesting point, I, I guess, in, you know, in this sort of, sort of evolution. But, I mean, sales of, um, you know, vinyl LPs and, you know, and sales of seven-inches are, uh, you know, doing pretty well. They've increased quite quite significantly in the last couple of years. I mean, I mean, take even the fact that, you know, Amazon.com, I think it's in October of 2007 or round about then, started selling vinyl records again, um, whereas they'd never done that as well as the download. So, they, I mean, but obviously some of this is, in, is, you know, exists within the kind of luxury market in a way that, you know, that we're getting, you know, 180 gram limited edition pressings, you know, or going back even back to kind of mono pressings of sort of 
classic rock albums, and those are being bought largely by sort of you know older consumers, um, you know, who perhaps you know in the CD era got rid of their albums, <laughs> and, you know, are buying them back again, much as they did uh, with the CD when you know they were persuaded to sort of part with their crinkly bits of vinyl that they may have had, you know, for some years, and, and replace them with something that was that was, they, that was better. Now, when and how low was the low point of vinyl from which it has come back? By the sort of mid nineties. I mean, there are slightly different, um, different, you know, different trends and so on. But yeah, I mean, I think it was at its lowest point in the nineteen nineties. I mean, the other factor actually in, in vinyls, sort of not demise, but I suppose diminution in a way in the in the in the late eighties was actually how we forget, perhaps, you know, how speedily um, that cassette. Uh, you know, were the big format of the sort of late 80s. Uh, you know, and the Sony Walkman, sort of the first thing in a way to uh, p- provide us with the ability to sort of walk around with an album, you know, and listen to it, you know, while walking or jogging, as, as was the fashion, obviously, then, as well as the uh, leggings and uh, headbands and so on. But yeah. <laughs> And with cassettes, you know, I was actually, of course, of course, I remember cassettes and owned quite a few myself at one time. But reading about them in your book and how big they actually were, it still came as kind of a surprise to me. Because, of course, these days people go on nostalgia trips with their vinyl. But I, rarely do I see anybody pulling out the cassettes and, and, and stoking their warm memories of, of, of a musical era past. Why is that? Well, I'd be surprised, actually. I mean, there's a bit, so people have manufactured these things which are essentially sort of um, like a memory stick within a cassette-shaped shop. So, I mean, you upload a set of tracks to it and you create, you know, the mixtape. So we have this kind of virtual recreation of the mixtape. So that, I think that lives on. And that's another element, actually, in, in, in the kind of shift you have with sort of iTunes and, and iPods and the idea of playlists. And that's much closer to sort of the selecting your tunes uh, in the way that we we sort of did with compilation tapes, you know, sort of, you know, trying to work out some sort of order. I mean, Nick Hornby, the English writer, English novelist, and stuff, and his book uh, High Fidelity expounds rather widely on the whole idea of the, of the mixtape and so on. But that's the first, you know, and, and it's sort of a seminal part in you know, and how kind of hip hop, uh, you know, travelled around. I mean, people like Africa and Africa and so on said that you know before they'd actually made albums, you know, they would record you know cassettes of their their sets, their mixing sets and stuff, and those would pass around. So, I mean, it's, you know, these different ways in which music has kind of been disseminated um, you know, via kind of, you know, shellac disc originally, originally you know, vinyl records, cassettes, CDs, and, and now in the kind of virtual MP3 uh, sort of file sharing world. Since you mentioned Nick Hornby, I do have to ask this. Now, as an Englishman writing a book about this kind of a cultural history of a certain format of music with a lot of personal reminiscences in there as well. How much was not being Nick Hornby a goal for you? <laughs> um, I, I, it wasn't, <laughs> I don't know if I deliberately set out not to be. I mean, he, you know, he, he, he writes very well, well, and he writes in his particular way. I, I have my own you know, idiosyncrasies and, and uh, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, Twists on on these things. So I mean, I I don't think I mean I don't think we're, we're particularly comparable. It has to be said. I, I mean, you know, I know what you mean as far as you know. That, you know, he's clearly a, a big force within within that world. I mean, I'm not sure that um, he was a writer that I, that I necessarily thought of first off as far as kind of music writing or all that kind of thing. Maybe more to the point is, I was wondering if you if it ever occurred to you to tr- to try to avoid being seen as wanting to be Nick Hornby. <laughs> Um, I, I think, I, well, I mean, I don't, I mean, the, the, book, the book have anecdotes, but I think, I mean, it's the structure of the book and everything else, it, it's kind of, it's ballast is history. I mean, what I tend to do is, you know, is add my own kind of personal asides into it, my own kind of crackpot theories about various <laughs> pieces and stuff, you know, <laughs> the, you know, the thrift store LPs or whatever, and I'll go off on a little sort of, you know, digression. Uh, and it's a digressive book, you know, and I, I sort of made, you know, made the comparison of the book. I mean, I did, uh, weirdly, actually, you know, I do think the album is, it, sorry, the um, the book about the LP, you know, as it is, is almost like a sort of, you know, compilation tape history of the format. Since vinyl we've established had its low point somewhere in the mid-90s, what, what are the events that happened around its revival? How did it get back on its on its feet? I, th- I do think that it, it is a, a sort of direct result of sort of downloading and, you know, the iPod. I mean, with something like the iPod, I mean, if, we, if you think about the, sort of the go, t- turn back the clock, you know, the whole point, the great thing about the vinyl record, um, you know, not only just is it, you know, is it giving you more money, 
uh, for your dollar, um, you know, sounding better, lasting longer, and the rest of it. But you know, Alex Steinweiss, uh, he's a, a designer at Columbia, uh, you know, creates this new, new, newfangled thing for it, which is the record sleeve. It has this perfect combination of you know, sounding better and looking better with you know, uh, you know, an attractive design cover, which also has information you can read on the back. Now, in a way, you know, we, if we shift on to the other formats and stuff, which had their own kind of benefits and so on as well, and one can become kind of you know, nostalgic about you know, the eight-track cartridge for its tacticity or you know, the cassette for you know, the sort of little inlays and all the rest of it, you know, depending on one's personal choice, obviously. But with the, with the iPod, uh, a little bit like the Sony Walkman before it, you create the, ob- the object you're actually playing it on becomes the sort of the more uh, important part of the equation somehow or other. And the whole point about the iPod is, you know, that... People who are really obsessed about music can have, you know, as much music on it as, as they like, you know, or almost as much as they like. And people who don't really care about music can, ju- or only have a kind of, you know, only, you know, only have a few things they like can be selective to pick out the bits they do want and just keep that core part of it. But the end result of that is you know, that, that music kind of floats around, and you know, and you can. I've done this myself, you know, uh, with you know, uh, sort of iTunes on my laptop. You know, I've been happily typing away. Without really noticing that you know, um, you know that alpha, my you know my albums are moving their way alphabetically through, you know, <laughs> you know I've slipped from sort of I don't know, uh, you know Bauhaus to the Beach Boys without without noticing <laughs> really, you know the one format you know has, has gone on from the other, and I think that sense of loss ended up uh, becoming a bit more pervasive, and that in turn. Uh, you know, made people think. You know, you know, maybe you know, maybe I do want to actually show my loyalty. And the thing about uh, about albums and and you know, and and records in general is that you sort of you are buying a little piece of something that you love. I mean, often if you think back to sort of you know, teen groups and and so on, even you know, even go back to kind of the Beatles and so on. You know, people would buy, uh, you know, these records to have you know something that's like an icon. You know, that you know, that, you know, you're buying. You know, you you know, rush out and buy the new single by this particular group or whatever, um, you know, to show your loyalty in a weird kind of way. And I think, you know, the, the, the downside in a sense of this rather more kind of ephemeral way of enjoying music, which is both means that people have much more music, but it produces the opposite reaction, is that people suddenly think, well, you know, I want to, I want to kind of value this thing. I want to, you know, to collect this, this thing as an object. I know, I mean, also you sort of, you have a, a sort of an explosion in a way of, of younger groups um, deliberately fetishizing something like the, the seven-inch single because they were, you know, they uh, were sort of, you know, liked that the aesthetic, of, you know, of, of say punk rock or whatever, and it, it existing on that format, and they kind of wanted to do that as much as they might wear, you know, Converse, Converse uh, trainers because they wanted to look like, you know, the Ramones or something. It's <laughs> that sort of you know, relationship with these things. With the, I, I suppose I should. I can call it the diversification of how people buy music these days. Of course, a lot, as we've said, sells on iTunes, and now people can buy certain albums on vinyl as well. Do you see this as a dimension of what journalists often like to talk about in, in pieces about markets, about the a greater number of options f- that are more tightly connected to whatever level of consumer you are. For example, like you've said, someone who cares only about getting the music through their earbuds can buy an iTunes. Somebody who wants a, a signed vinyl and dinner with the artist may be able to get that. Is, is, do you see that happening? I think that, I think that, that is the case, yes. Um, I, mean, it, I mean, it's not entirely clear to me I mean, quite what level that, that interaction takes place. Because I'm sure there are people who are kind of musical fanatics who have cast aside their, their vinyl records. I just prefer. It. I mean, one of the, what's interesting is about you know the arrival of something like Spotify. A friend of mine the other, other week said you know, that you know he was hunting around for a particular track, uh, you know, in his record collection, couldn't find it, and then gave up and you know <laughs> looked it up and listened to it on Spotify. <laughs> I think that, you know there are clearly you know clearly ease of access will you know will out. Uh, I think and on the whole, that's been the sort of ongoing sort of story of of music in one you know music formats in one form, form, form or another. I think that's right. I mean, it's, I, I think it's, I think we are, there are levels of sort of engagement where, you know, whether you buy your, you know, what format you buy your music and that, you know, has become part of that sort of consumer, um, sort of, you know, that expressing oneself through these consumer objects. But in, but in a sense, that's, that's, that was certainly the story with, you know, uh, with sort of records, you know, full stop. I mean, if we, I mean, if we go back to the, the sort of LP again, Honestly, hang, bang on about it, but um, but I mean, <laughs> Mick Jagger and and Keith Richards, for instance, uh, you know, meet 
their, their child, they've been at school together, but they, you know, they've gone to different colleges and so on. And, and one day you can encounter one another you know, on a train coming back in, through Kent. And under his arm, you know, um, Mick Jagger has you know, some rare, imp- in Britain at the time, you know, rare imported chess blues albums by Muddy Waters. Uh, and, you know, Keith Richards sees these albums under his arm and, and, and feels like almost as if it's a sort of, you know, accolade of some secret order, I have to go up and speak to him. And they have a conversation and they meet and agree to, um, you know, to, to come to a band rehearsal and, and so on. And, you know, and the rest is, you know, the, you know, uh, yeah, the Rolling Stones. So, you know, um, so, so in a sense, we've, we've, I mean, I, you know, if we go back, you know, to kind of the 1950s, you know, and, um, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and sort of, you know, easy listening on LPs and, or even, you know, the sort of huge classical market, you know, things that people like Glenn Gould and so on, um, you know, have huge successes on LPs, you know, in, in, in a popular form, you know, because they're, they become, you know, that year's kind of that album or that artist uh, that everyone has to have. The difference now, in a sense, is of course that people don't necessarily have to buy it. Uh, so you know how you make money out of it is the uh, when people don't have to buy it then either. But you know, but um, you know, the impetus is less for people to buy stuff rather than sort of you know email it to each other as MP3 files or copy it or stream it or whatever else. I have to ask this because it, it seems to come up fairly often in the musical histories I read. What is it with England and the gigantic cultural consequences of people bumping into one another on trains? I mean, the, the Rolling <laughs> it comes Stones. having a shonky transport network. <laughs> 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 well, in those days, it was less bad than it is now. <laughs> but, uh, um, I, I, well, you know, we're a small island. You know, uh, it's sometimes easier to get around on public transport. You know, in our rather clogged. Clogged roads, but yeah, you know, <laughs> there we are. Uh, one of the points I make in the book about the eight-track cartridges, you know, that Gethin, when he was running Asylum Records, would have um, you know all new, you know, all demo tapes transferred onto eight-track, so he could you know drive around LA in his car, you know, and seeing whether or not these, you know, whether he should sign these acts. So I mean, they're kind of interesting, uh, and, you know, and even even the cassette format, you know, is uh, you know, the eight-track itself, you know, is developed very you know, specifically for the car. So you know, different ways of uh, we been able to listen to our music, you know, and cassettes. So, you know, we're, we're a very kind of car, car-friendly car format, um, you know, and, and that clearly changed, you know, how what was listened to. And, and also in the state, you know, the, the phenomena of, you know, of FM radio in, in the late 60s with them playing a lot, you know, a lot more album tracks, producing a different sort of relationship towards music. I did love that Geffen quote you included in the book where he says, you know, I'm essentially, in effect, I'm such a power player in the music industry, I have demo albums converted specially to 8-track tape for my car, which happens to have an 8-track. And I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was once a huge thing. And uh, these days, you know, if you had a cassette player in your car, you'd be regarded as something of a Luddite. Yes. Um, but, you know, that's, there's nothing like, you know, technology for that, isn't it? What, you know, what's one point at the you know the cutting edge is you know is, is history very very quickly and that, I mean that's the extraordinary thing about about the you know the vinyl record is that you know this thing is you know sixty years old uh, and it, you know and they, they and they still sound great they're still they you know they're one of those incredible one of the incredible pieces of you know a format rather like the paperback book with which you know shares you know, some of the some similar histories in in, in respects as you know as far as being uh, you know putting uh, you know great works of art. Uh, you know, and music, classical music, and uh, jazz, and and you know, folk and blues and stuff, uh, you know, into the, into people's hands, uh, and, you know, in, in a format that, that that they can still listen to to this day, in the way that you can still grab a you know a copy of I don't know, on the road or whatever off the shelf and and, and read it, you know, as, as you as you would have done in the fifties. Intellectually, before reading the book, I mean, I knew that vinyl LPs were were sixty years old. This was a sixty year old technology, but. I don't know. I don't know exactly how to technically explain this, but the, using listening to a vinyl album today, you know, one that may be newly pressed, it's not that different a technology than then, is it? I mean, they sound surprisingly good, is what I'm getting at for something that's. Yeah, that no. Old. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the format, you know, the dynamic range on them, how they're pressed, how the, you know, the interlay of the, you know, the, the grooves to the speakers and stuff. No, I mean, they sound. Uh, they still sound great. I mean, I, I mean, out of one of the. The fallouts, in a way, from new digital technology is that um, because of the you know the the, 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 form, the thing of compressing the sound, um, you know, to get kind of as much volume out of it, you lose some dynamic range in, in some digital transfers and things like some MP3 files and so on are, are, are at a lower quality than than a good kind of pressing of a vinyl record. 
And I do have to ask about this. You mentioned this in the book, of course. The CD is getting louder over time, production-wise, and uh, right. losing their range. Why would a why would a studio want to press a CD louder? I mean, I, I feel like I can, I can turn it up arbitrarily high with my own amplifier. Well, some some of that is to do with you know where it's first heard. Um, you know, there's a kind of an urge to impress. Uh, again, you know, again, also one of the things that, that, that has happened, which is also the, sort of a thing with the i, i you know, um, the, uh, I, the iPod as well, is that we're often listening to our music outside or, or in a space where other other things are intruding upon us, and so therefore there's a kind of greater effort for some of that to be produced at a greater volume, so it's not drowned out by in the sort of background noise. And I know I was just mentioning how good I think vinyl still sounds today, but I do wonder now that I think about it, when I pull a vinyl record off the shelf that was that was produced in 2000, say, and is it actually the same technology that one produced in 1950? Are they the same thing, or has there been developments within the actual piece of piece of vinyl we play? Very, very little in the actual. I mean, there, there were things, there were, you know, a format called Dynaflex and other bits and pieces which were tried in the seventies, which were kind of thinner, bendier version, and, and the quality of uh, the vinyl used uh, has diminished. I mean, there were there are a few, uh, but essentially it's rough and semi. Uh, the only thing that that has changed in a way is is the mastering of it. You know, where where it would be mar- more likely the recording would have been mastered digitally, and then it's being reproduced sort of analogly. If you know what I mean. So that that may well have well have changed. I mean, there are you know among purists, you know, um, sort of you know the the original mono pressings of certain you know certain jazz albums are some of the ones that, you know that people look out for uh, you know very particularly. And obviously you, you have you know with some of the repressings uh, a label called um, Sundays, who I think are based in California actually, but you know repressing kind of you know classic sixties album and going back to the original sort of mono master tapes and mono plates to reproduce them as closely back to the original. As as they can. We mentioned a little bit earlier how you you saw your iTunes playlist scrolling from one thing to another, somewhat somewhat disarmingly. And what what are your current listening habits like as far as the media you use to listen to music? How much is vinyl? How much is how much is iTunes? How much is uh, cassettes? Maybe it, I have to say I, we we I don't have a kind of working cassette player at the moment. So sadly, the cassettes <laughs> <laughs> have fallen by the wayside. <laughs> Um, I listen to I do listen to a lot of vinyl. I have to say. I mean, um, we. I mean, at home. Uh, you know, my wife and I. We. You know, we have. You know, we have. We have. You know, we have a lot. You know, we have an i. We have an iPod. You know, we have iTunes. I have CDs. We still have. You know, CDs and stuff. But I do. I mean, I do still buy. Um, uh, you know, I, I literally just bought the uh, uh, last week. There's a, a new album by a sort of Californian sort of psych rock band called, called the Wooden Ship. Uh, his new album I bought on vinyl, and I will still buy, you know, um, new issues of uh, or new new albums by new artists on vinyl, as well as buying sort of you know, all, you know, older albums but on on vinyl, ones that I missed or ones that I just you know literally come across, you know, in junk shops or whatever else. I mean, you know, I have a sort of a slightly addictive uh, <laughs> sort of uh, personality when it comes to records. I you know I am a bit of a hoarder. So I will just kind of go off and hoover all these things up. But yeah, I mean, I, and also you know I. I've, I have to have a lot of um, seven-inch singles. I mean, I mean, I DJ intermittently, and, uh, and when I, I tend to play with this, uh, this, you know, bits and bobs from kind of the fifties and sixties, on the whole, when I when I do that, and so I have you know a big big collection of, of seven-inch singles as well, and I'll, I'll play those. And so you know, I, I tend to tend to go through all of them, and, and we I do also have a a, a wind-up um, shellac, you know. Uh, 78 record player as well so <laughs> like i said i that doesn't i play that fairly sparingly but yeah i mean i i play them all really i mean they, they all have their own little idiosyncrasies and, and sort of qualities and so on i mean i have to say i i tend not to buy cds if if i can help <laughs> yeah i tend to either download them or buy the or buy the vinyl um if you know if it's not available on vinyl i'll, I'll, I'll probably usually usually download but um just because, I think partly because you know they are such a you know that that rather <laughs> the terrible jewel cases and you know they tend to crack very easily and they slip around and you lose them and and so on. Whereas at least the vinyl with the sort of substantiveness of the object means that you know that you can stick them on a shelf and you kind of know where they are. 
<laughs> Doing your research, did you ever find any answers as far as just the the horrible design of CD jewel cases? They're one of the they're one of the longest lived, most widespread bad design items I can think of. I know. Well, I mean, also, I mean, in the states, you also you also had the the, for, the formula the formula which is the, the long box. Oh, with the long box. Yes, big, we had that. The cardboard thing that used to be on the on the top of them, which actually, for some reason, in Britain we we didn't get. But um, but yeah, kind of. Our mental, an environmental catastrophe, really, a work of cardboard and additional unnecessary packaging. Um, I, I generally don't know. I, mean, I, I think it's just, I mean, you know, if for, for a practicality point of view, it, it's like an extension of a sort of cassette case, really. I mean, there, you know, there were some which were done in a sort of a better, almost like a cardboard finish, which seemed a little less offensive than the dual case. But uh, no, I mean, I didn't, I mean, it, it was predominantly a book about, about records. I know, see, I, I I, you know, I found the CD interesting as much because of, of how, in a way, some of the things that, that the LP did, I, you know, um, putting lots of things which had previously been out of circulation back into circulation. I, I think there were interesting parallels there, but I didn't, didn't delve too too closely into, the, into some of the, the very specifics of who'd actually come up with the, the dual case or anything like that. You laugh about the long box, but I still have some of them, and they actually trade over here for a... Oh, really? yeah, sort of a yeah. premium, you know, if, if you have a CD with a long box. Yeah, yeah, they're a bit like the sort of, you know, the un, unpeeled uh, uh, Andy Warhol banana <laughs> albums for the first uh, Underground and Nico album, aren't they? You know, they, if you have them and they're still in, in reasonable condition, then they probably, probably do trade for quite a lot of cash. Yes, younger friends who don't believe me that long box ever existed, I, I have to pull them out to actually show them, no, these things were real. But, <laughs> but aside from long boxes, it's it's not exactly what we're ta- what the focus of this conversation should be. Now, Anybody who reads the vinyl countdown will imagine you as living in a home that's just stacked to the ceiling with uh, crates and crates and crates of vinyl. Is that, is that a true image? It's not far off. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, we only have a you know we live in London. We have a small flat, ah, <laughs> so, yes. you know, um, but uh, there is yeah there are there there are quite a lot of records there. To be fair. You start off in the book with an image uh, in your childhood of being told not to drop the needle. To to uh, to suddenly onto the album, not to scratch the surface of the right. LP. Were you? I don't want to say born of a vinyl enthusiast, but was was there a decisive point where you became an enthusiast of vinyl, or did you just happen to grow up in the setting and continue on the trajectory? I think more the latter, actually. I mean, my, I, I think that it, I think it was just well, the other thing I begin the book with, is, which is the way that my my parents didn't have very many records. My, my father had this thing where he'd had um, this collection of sort of um, Buddy Holly um, records, uh, which he'd, his sister, I think, my aunt had, had made off with, and he'd always kind of speak rather wistfully about these things. But it never really seemed to be there; never seemed to be any impetus on his part to go out and buy them again or anything like that. Um, <laughs> and I think, really, from the age of about sort of eight or nine, when I first started buying sort of singles and then albums, uh, and we had out, you know, I just um, was hooked from there. Really, and, I mean, and of course, at that at that point, I'm in my sort of you know, my late thirties. Uh, so you know that was that was the format. You know, you you bought you know you bought seven inches or you bought an album. Uh, and I in the end, you know, and I quickly sort of fell very speedily into buying albums. Um, and um, it just sort of carried on. Really, I mean, when CDs arrived, um, I was fairly I, I I sort of clung on to um, to, to buying al- albums. But there was a, was a point which is you know I think is in the sort of in the late. 80s, early 90s, when you know when certain albums just weren't available on vinyl, it was just cassette or CD. Uh, so if you wanted to have this particular you know, band's album, you would have to buy it on, on CD. And that, I mean, that's one of the interesting things now is that lots of people, you know, bands like even some, some of the Magnetic Fields, who never released uh, their original albums on, on on vinyl, are now reissuing them on on LP. So I mean, you know, that's a kind of interesting moment in history as well. But I just I just always kept buying vinyl. I mean, and also to be to be honest, to be frank about it. You know, I was um, a student through some of that period, and you know, and then working, at, you know, in bookshops and uh, as a as a clerk, a clerk, um, you know. So uh, you know, I didn't have a huge amount of money, um, and at that point, um, you know, CDs were more expensive than vinyl because vinyl was kind of <laughs> new. New vinyl records were kind of on the way out, so actually, it was a good way to buy, to get new music was to buy it on vinyl. So um, you know, which obviously now has flipped around the other way, whereas you know now some of these um, 180 gram, you know. Premium press, pressings are at, have correspondingly uh, premium prices. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you, in the writing of this book, were you calling on a, 
the sort of vast store of knowledge you had accumulated yourself by being a vinyl enthusiast for so long, or did you, or were you not so much into the history as you were listening all these years? I think a, mi- a mixture. Well, I, 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 you know, in a way, there were there were kind of fields of music. I mean, the, the book, you know, in, in, inevitably, when you're when you're sort of writing a book, it sort of changed uh, in sort of in shape and scope. I mean, originally, you know, I, how, it was going to be just about sort of I, well, I, in my head, I thought it was going to be about you know the the, the, the format, but about mainly about pop music or rock music. Um, and in the end, I, I found I was going to have jazz in there originally, but. But somehow or other, you know, I, I suddenly found there was all this other stuff which I'd sort of half considered, but not really considered, like comedy, for instance, on on record and documentary discs and and easy listening, which I always have a bit of a had a kind of a soft spot for. Um, but you know, I hadn't really kind of delved into it in, in, in quite the, quite the way that you know, in the end, the sort of the research sort of drew me into different kind of areas that I was less aware of, and sometimes those are the bits that um, were kind of most fascinating to kind of go back, you know, and read through old. Issues of kind of high fidelity and, and these, you know, curious interviews with sort of old um, practitioners and you know people pressing stuff and so on. So uh, it was, a, you know, it was a mixture of, of your your own knowledge and sensibility, you know, and what and things that interested you and had always interested you, um, and then just and also you know, much like kind of listening to music you haven't heard before, um, you know, discovering new things and, and also discovering things by listening to stuff that you hadn't hadn't heard before. If you've just tuned in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. Find our complete interview archive and more on the website, colinmarshallradio.com. My guest is Travis Elbro, author of The Vinyl Countdown, the album from LP to iPod and back again. One thinks of when, when thinking about what made the vinyl album into the iconic format. We know it today. One thinks of big concept albums and bands that have sold millions and millions of a single album. They, they think of bestsellers. They think of, you know, uh, double albums. They think of huge projects like that. But what is most interesting, I think, in, in the early part of your history of the vinyl album is that the genres that made the album the album, that made the LP the LP, aren't exactly the ones you would expect. For example, comedy. What other sorts of genres were were the format definers of the early days of the LP? Well, I mean, I mean, it seems like, um, I mean, curiously, I mean, it, it I mean, the, the, one of the first big hits on, on, on the new format, uh, is, is the original cast recording of South Pacific, which is almost, you know, because it's so ubiquitous, you sort of come across them in, you know, uh, in, in thrift bins across, you know, across the States and, and in England, you know, that you've just, that you stop to think about it. But actually, you know, this idea of having two sides, being able to listen to sort of 20 odd minutes of music, almost, in complete holes, opens up this whole market market for um, for um, you know, sort of car- show tunes, you know, and, and cast recordings of musicals, and later on, you know, film soundtracks. Oh, almost at the same time, really. I mean, it, some of those existed prior to that on you know on the seventy eight as these kind of boxed albums, but it just creates a whole you know whole different audience for the for these kinds of music and. Um, so you have that. You also have, I mean, a, a sort of slight spin-off from um, sort of the easy listening thing, which again was a, was a huge thing. Where you know, and also we have to remember, I suppose, the L, the LP arrives at a point of you know increasing affluence, but also increasing suburbanisation. So people are spending longer at home, and they're entertaining at home. So they, you know, an, an LP allows you to, to create your create mood in much ways that you would you know, sort of um, scatter cushions or you know cook particular meals or serve. Particularly lethal cocktails to your guests as they, <laughs> as they arrive to it or else. You know, it's a, it's a theme setting thing. So you could have, you know, Mantovani tinkling away in the background. Um, so, uh, you know, and one of the offshoots of that is, is a whole sort of genre of sort of travelogue LPs. You know, Michelle Legrand's, you know, I, I Love Paris, which is a huge hit when it first arrived. So this different way of experiencing sort of sound with the cover and, and the LP, those things, um, which are, you know, largely the precursor to sort of concept albums by the, you know, by the likes of, you know, um, Big Floyd or, you know, all the sort of prog rock types like Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Um, you know, and uh, so, you know, those things kind of feed in in different ways. So those are kind of genre forming things. Um, another, you know, another thing which is slightly related, I guess, is the sort of reissuing factor is that, um, you know, things like Robert Johnson's recordings, which, you know, have been kind of largely lost on 78 and uh, get reissued on LP, which then, you know, People like Bob Dylan and so on, and the album actually appears on his own cover of uh, you know, "Bringing It All Back Home," and he's in his little um, 
nuclear shelter. So the, the way these records sort of permeate different other people's consciousness and then inform other records is one of the kind of interesting things that the sort of format does. Um, you also have things like spoken word recordings, um, a company called Cademont, um, run by you know, two Smith graduates in, in, in New York. Uh, you know, they stalk Dylan Thomas down and, and get him to read his poems, and this is not long before he, he dies. Um, so you, you have these sort of, you know, these, these sort of um, fragile moments of our whole kind of cultural history, which are collected on this format, which are, which are only possible because of, because of uh, this, the format, and also, it has to be said, the arrival of magnetic tape, which makes the sort of recording albums much easier. You have things like, you know, being able to put whole operas, you know, Wagner's Ring Cycle, almost impossible to record, uh, or certainly making it in a viable format before that um, you know, uh, becomes, you know, Schulte's recordings of that, which takes, you know, seven years to make or whatever, and they record the entire cycle, you know, in a way that you know, previously would have been almost unfeasible. There were lots of fascinating things that I've learned from reading your book that people did with the LP format in its early decades, but in this earlier part of the book, I did run across an explanation of a phenomenon that had bothered me for a long time because often I will go to the thrift shops we have here and I'll search through. They, they always have crates and crates of vinyl. And I always I, I get excited digging through them, just thinking, oh, well, I'm going to find something really good yep. today. But it's always uh, Ray Conniff, Montevani, Lawrence Welk, Montevani. Yeah. It, it's just, it's a very, very, very specific type of music. And I know, yeah. I know this sold well, but why? how did it all end up in the goodwills, as we call them here? Yes, no, I know. I, 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 I spent many an hour in the Goodwills uh, of, uh, of Indianapolis, Virginia, and, and New York. So ah. yes, <laughs> but, um, I, um, I, well, I mean, I, my, you know, I, I kind of posit a rather sort of uh, indulgent theory, which in a way is that it's sort of, you know, the case of kind of easy, easy, easy come, easy go listening in a way that uh, <laughs> this, uh, but I, you know, some of it's just generational. That you know that. Um, that you know, this, this is the sort of prehistory of sort of, uh, of for many people of you know of. of popular music in a way and you know lots of people who used to listen to that sort of stuff you know either moved on to other stuff you know embraced um the emerging kind of pop and rock stuff or that they have in a sense probably you know it's all tended to be older people who are sadly no longer with us in a way you know and that, and that music you know may go and you know and that's and that is one of the, the, the quite the, i mean the wonderful thing about you know this, this stuff being out there and being in thrift stores and okay maybe it's they're not they're particularly those LPs, but that sort of dormant, that's the great thing about it in a way for a time, and which is the internet and the instant availability of everything is slightly changing, was in a way that things could lay dormant and then be kind of rediscovered. I think like a singer-songwriter like Nick Drake, you know, not particularly popular in his in his lifetime, but, you know, is then rediscovered um, and, you know, and becomes an influence later on and stuff. And, and I think in a way sometimes we need, or, or certainly in the past anyway, needed acts to be to kind of lay dormant like Robert Johnson and so on for people to kind of get something fresh from them rather than the, rather than stuff that's you know all pervasively popular where you know where we we probably can't see can't quite see some some of the nuances for it anymore I feel like it, any it hasn't happened yet but any day there's going to be a large scale ironic revival of all these Montevani albums I mean I, <laughs> I kind of fear it but it seems like they're getting so cheap it's got to happen someday doesn't it well, it may, maybe, maybe. I mean, I, I mean, that's, there was a kind of easy listening boom in the in the sort of in the early '90s, and that you know that sort of uh, sort of uh, Quentin Tarantino soundtrack stuff of sort of you know twang guitar surf stuff, and and you know, and yeah, and uh, combustible Edison, and but they they some of that was mined at that point. But yeah, I mean, it, it's only plausible. I mean, I mean, it's also you know how um, I mean, people like sort of Bing Crosby as well, and these huge stars and so on, and you know, and who knows? I mean, I think you know some of the reasons why some of the acts in the past. Did survive, and it's an archer, perhaps, for instance, who's you know, it's because he did create this kind of body of work, which is kind of on LP, which sort of stands up. So again, you will do tend to find quite a lot of you know, bizarre, cheap uh, Sinatra compilations in, in Goodwill bins as well. So yes. <laughs> now, I wanted to know about the the genesis of this particular project, the Vinyl Countdown, or the Long Player Goodbye, as it was when you wrote it over there. Uh, yeah. What. I guess what what brought you to the point where you were going to write a book about all this? Well, I mean, it, it was a couple of things. I mean, one was that there just literally used to be these, uh, you know, these. I, well, you know, well, an area of London I live in in northeast London. Uh, I, you know, often would you know, take a take a stroll on a warm summer's afternoon, and, and then this particular sort of um, sort of what I might politely be called can men, i.e., you know, uh, men who 
drink strong cans of lager in, in the park, you know, to pass <laughs> away their, their time. And they'd ha- they had these, had this little portable cassette player, and they would play this particular album by uh, the Waterboys, um, called Fisherman's Blues. And they just seemed to play it endlessly every day, kind of again and again and again. Uh, and, you know, and I, I, it just made me start thinking, well, you know, what was the first album and what would it like just to be, just to have this one album? And, and again, this was at the point where, you know, the vast iTunes and the iPod had, had, had arrived, and it just made me start to think back, you know, to, to you know how different it must have been, you know, what, what had existed before the album. Uh, we go back to kind of Shellac seventy eight and so on, and what and how that changed things. So that that was really the sort of um, the sort of driving factor, I guess, in, in how and how the idea for the book uh, came about. I picture the research process as being one of those, you know, one of those processes that an outside observer will think was fun like you'd get to listen to a lot a lot of vinyl but w- was it really fun i mean i guess how much fun was it the so you, you see listening to the records and you know and flicking through back issues of you know high fidelity and the new musical express and uh you know disc and echo weekly or whatever or, you know, <laughs> that, that part was immensely fun uh turning all of those notes and everything in, into the book is obviously it's, it's less fun <laughs> and, and also there is that sort of um you know that difficulty about you know what what to put in what to leave out uh, and so on you know and the book ended up being you know longer than i initially intended it to be and uh you know, and, and you know and people still you know will say you know why is the next album in there or whatever <laughs> you know, that's you know that's, that's the inevitability of it really so i mean yeah it was um I, I had you know i had a lot of fun writing it in the in the end but you, but, you know obviously you uh, you know, it, these things are sort of hard work and you know and it's a project that you know i'd the idea from it um i you know i'd had uh, I mean, I, I took a good couple of years writing it, but the idea actually was a, a couple of years before that, and I'd, I'd done another book in between. So it sort of had been totally on on hold while I did something else. So, yeah, you know, it was, it was, I had enormous fun doing it, yeah. And in the writing of this book, I mean, it certainly probably occurred to you early on that in writing a history of the LP, you were going to have to write about the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Beach Boys, Frank Sinatra, uh, the Sex Pistols, all kinds of, of famous jazz men as well. And, it must have been quite a daunting task in your mind to think to yourself, well, I've got to write, I've got to not repeat something that's, I've yeah. got to not repeat yeah. Whether I achieve you know. that is another matter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 I tried in a sense, the idea, yeah, I mean, that, that, that was obviously difficult. And, I mean, and that's probably out for other, other readers to work out whether I came up with anything particularly original or not. <laughs> I, mean, the, the, I suppose the hook was always the LP. It was, it was, that was, it was kind of, however, you know, there are occasions when you'd be you know, happily typing up some sort of amusing story about, you know, quite a famous artist and then kind of have to kind of fall back and think, hang on a minute, that's not really about the LP, is it? Let's just get rid of that. <laughs> um, so I think that was, that was sort of, the, you know, how, how, how I tried to do it. I mean, I don't know, so I think, you know, again, it's, it's tricky. I mean, I, I could easily, I think, you know, in retrospect, have ended the book in the kind of in, in the 60s and sort of called time on it earlier, you know, and, and you know, left. But I, but I think to do that as well, you know, you, you people who, you know, uh, you know, who love albums and stuff, you would be leaving out, you know, lots of people's uh, favorites. I mean, I've still probably left out lots of people's favorites, but you know, be, it, it would it would seem a, kind of slightly churlish to do that. So in a way, to not mention, you know, Dark Side of the Moon or um, Sgt. Pepper's or you know, uh, Pet Sounds and that, I, I, would, I think it would end up being quite an odd book about the LP in that way. You know, <laughs> however much you know that there are things that you know that I I, I do slightly skimp on and overlook um, an artist I, I could mention, but I'm, <laughs> I feel like them for the readers to discover themselves. But, you know, I, you know, there's not a lot on, you know, on heavy metal, for instance, or um, certain other genres I could, could think of. I mean, um, so, you know, you, you always have to leave kind of certain things out by disposition and interest as much as anything else. You, still, you know, you've still got to live with writing about these things or listening to them as well. So you know, I think that, that there are clearly... Some gaps, and you know, obviously, you know, there are you know a few sort of you know bad cover versions in a sense of, of of quite well known stories. But I think you know, as long as you can sort of give your own sort of spin on those stories or set it in sort of a different kind of context, then I think you, you feel you've done justice to to the story. And you know, and I, you know, I think as a book is, I hope anyway, a, a book which is often about stories. You know, that are kind of you know fascinating little stories. You know, from the LP is a, a very stage of its, its you know, development from, you know, Brian Wilson, you know, 
uh, you know, listening to the Beatles and, you know, and, you know, Rubber Soul and, and, you know, running in and telling his wife, you know, they, they've only put good songs on this. You know, <laughs> I want to make an LP like that. You know, those little stories, which, you know, some people know, some people don't, but you feel, you know, in, you know, in, in the story of the vinyl LP and so on and, and vinyl in general are, are kind of part of the sort of fabric of the stuff. Um, so, yeah. How, what kind of a balance were you aiming to strike between... I, I don't know if objective is the word, but kind of a an even-handed cultural history and and a slant toward your own personal tastes, because some some of the book's most entertaining parts seem to be informed by what you personally like and dislike. Though I could be wrong about that. Well, I mean, I, I suppose I was I was probably striving to be um, trying to be fairly objective. I mean, I think you know there are there are things in there and there and genres in there and so on where, which. Um, an artist in there and stuff whose work I'm probably less fond of or, or don't you know, particularly like, but to not have them in in the book would be. I mean, I'm one of the things about research because you suddenly realise that you, you know your own, you know, like my own 1980s, for instance, was uh, you know quite different from <laughs> from the kind of mainstream 1980s <laughs> uh, because that was you know when I was a teenager and you know and I listened to lots of what I suppose the equivalent thing would be kind of college rock, you know, independent music and stuff. That was what I listened to. Um, but there's only, you know, only so much space one could allocate to um, listening to, you know, obscure <laughs> sort of bands of that of that ill. So I think, you know, I, you know, I think you, I was, I suppose I was trying to create something that was as universal as possible. But I think, and I think, hopefully, you know, in, in the bits that you said you liked, you know, I the bits where I inject my own opinion or or talk about records that I myself self like. You hope in a way that. In talking about the kind of individual, you can also be universal. And I think that's that's what one ideally was aiming you would aim for in a way, which is to try and try and make people, even if they don't like a particular record, get why this record is you know, is part of the story of of the LP. And, you know, and, uh, and the whole point about you know music and how we listen to it and how we move through time with it is that different records sort of edge up, you know, I mean, and become more important uh, as a different generation. Perhaps embraces those. I mean, I think the interesting thing about something like the Beatles LPs, for instance, is, is how which one is the more, you know, when I was growing up, you know, the, the, cred, the one you were supposed to have, you know, quote unquote, was, you know, Sergeant Peppers, and then, it, and then later on it became Revolver, and you know, then it was, you know, Rubber Soul, and so on. You know, how, these, how these records, their pecking order, you know, and then more recently maybe the White Album, you know. Uh, so, you know, these, you know, these, uh, even, you know, a, you know, a core, rather popular canon of music, you know, can shift in, in critical. And I think that you know that's what I was trying to to do. I guess would I be entirely mistaken to draw from your book that you are not a particular fan of of say prog rock? Uh, no, it's the opposite. Um, really? I, I quite like um, a lot of prog rock. I like a lot of um, uh, you know, uh, I like a lot of um, I like a lot of more the more slightly more obscure. I mean, I like you know the German prog rock uh, bands, you know, Can and uh, and Faust and. Um, and Dool and, and and those kind of bands I, I like a lot. I'm, I'm less a fan of uh, of sort of Emerson Lake and Palmer and, and, <laughs> and yes, the sort of more bombastic and weirdly kind of more English angle of of, of prog rock. I, I do. I have a soft spot for um, 70s uh, Genesis, um, you know, and I like um, and there's a particular uh, prog rock album by a Swedish person which is a um, called uh, which is now more based on Lord of the Rings, you know, and I, I I've you know, long, my inner warlock has was long since uh, van- vanished. You know, when I was about ten. But I, this particular album, I think, you know, is an amazing record. So I, I do. I have a, I have a soft spot for concept albums and and, and prog, but maybe you know, not. I don't. You know, not the the more kind of um, bombastic, uh, pompous end of it. The more kind of avant, stranger sort of uh, German end. I'm I'm, I'm more of a, a fan of. I didn't realize music journalists were allowed by law to like Genesis at all. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I think I think you know. They, they, well, I, I have to say, I, I draw the line at the kind of um, I think it's the trick of the tail. The, but once the Phil Collins era gets you know underway, I, I, I tend to kind of drift off. I, you know, I like um, I quite like you know Peter Gabriel's uh, stuff, and uh, so I, I I think you know I think we're we can be uh, you know we're past the sort of um, the sort of post uh, post punk era where you know there was a kind of uh, a sort of policing of those boundaries. I think we can we can be as indulgent in our, in our idiosyncrasies as anyone else. But you're probably not putting invisible touch on the uh, turntable. No, no, I, I don't own invisible touch. I have to say. <laughs>
Oh, the, wife, the wife may have a copy somewhere. I, I haven't <laughs> seen it. So. I feel like sooner or later, everybody somehow comes into possession of a few copies of Invisible Touch. They, just, <laughs> they kind of accrete on you. But uh, I was this, this brings me to something we haven't covered that much, but it was yep. one of the most fascinating elements of the book, which is the development, not necessarily, not just, of the LP as a technical piece of uh, quote-unquote software, yeah. but uh, as an art form, the actual LP as as an artist would, would conceive it. Mm. Now, um, with prog rock, prog rock it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it's cast in the book as one of the driving forces in its more bombastic incarnation to bring a backlash against the LP format. But what, uh, I, I mean, we can say the Beatles, we can say people like that. Who, who, were the, what, who or what were the drivers of the, the LP as a unit of creation artistically? Well, I mean, I, 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 mean, I think, I mean, my... I, that's really, you know, spooling back a little bit. I, you know, I, I think really someone like Frank Sinatra is kind of pivotal in 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 carving out the idea of of, of the LP as a, as, a, as a means of kind of artistic expression. I mean, he in interviews spoke about sort of how he would he took his took his cue from uh, his old band uh, leader Tommy Dorsey, who used to kind of pace live sets. Uh, and so, you know, and Sinatra would would do the same, and and you know, and that, those ideas, the kind of the mood music thing, the idea that you have a kind of concept that you run through, and so on. So you 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 have that. You, I mean, you you would, um, I mean, you know, on the more kind of you know popular front of of albums, you know, things like you know, you know Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the of the Moon has a kind of cohesive whole and kind of a theme to it. I mean, you know, it's it's a sort of Sonically, it's an amazing piece of work. I mean, it, it's an actual theme is a little on the shallow side, but, but you know, such, is, <laughs> such is the way of these things. Um, you know, so those kind of people. But, you know, also those kind of late 60s uh, sort of pioneer. I mean, you, you, uh, my wife, who absolutely loathes Bob Dylan, but, you know, someone like Bob Dylan, uh, you know, for carving out uh, a sort of, you know, an, a kind of a, a very kind of mercurial body of work, you know, and changing in styles as he goes on, you know, plugging in and going in on electric you know, with uh, and then doing sort of you know the first double along with um, Frank Zappa or with um, uh, Blonde on Blonde. So you know these are the people that sort of push music in it. I mean, obviously the Beatles. Uh, I mean, again, that how quickly it changes. I mean, you know, sort of Mick Jagger described you know I was sort of happily telling everyone in the world that you know Aftermath was going to be the longest LP ever made, and you know, and then bam, you get you know Freak Out and uh, Blonde on Blonde, you know, <laughs> these first doubles, you know, trumping it within you know, within months. So you know that kind of stuff. I mean, uh, you know. You know, even I mean, I think you know, with the whole thing about the sort of prog and the and the bombastity of it, and so on, you do get this sort of drawback, you know, with punk, where you know people want to kind of have something a, a bit more. But even in, within that, as I'm, I try to argue in the book, someone like both you know Patti Smith and, and the Ramones, you know, make their their big you know splash in the first Ramones album, you know, is is almost a sort of you know um, the sort of blueprint for for punk, both sartorially and musically. You know, the shot at the I can't you know shot of them in front of the brick wall becomes like a sort of, you know, a punk cliche after a while. But, you know, but, the, but you know, that album of, in a sense, making an album which is, you know, you know barely long enough to be a single almost, you know, <laughs> is a kind of buzzsaw sound, you know, uh, you know, disseminates that particular style along. And, you know, and, you know, and even, you know, the more in prior to that, you know, have, you know, people like Lee Reed and, and you know, and David Bowie, you know, and Ziggy Stardust, these are kind of, these are, you know, are, are albums which, you know, have you know have have a thematic hole and kind of do interesting things with music and, you know, and I personally I mean I think you know I I can happily I could go on a desert island I think with possibly I mean, probably lots of other albums as well but you know but you know like David Bowie and uh, you know and uh, what's going on by Marvin Gaye as well which was you know um, fantastic sort of you know State of the Nation um, album uh, you know the early seventies you know for Amer for America and so you know th those are those are albums which are, which are Sort of part of the back, but I mean, there are, there are plenty others, you know, which are uh, sort of you know, less less obvious and more uh, more obscure, which you know, um, which sort of form I mean, it's an album, you know, which I you know I, I, I quite like, but it's not you know, it's not something I'm a huge fan of. But something like Tapestry by Carol King, you know, as far as the sort of early seventies, you know, singer songwriter thing, and people listening to these kind of sensitive albums, you know, James Taylor and, and, and that sort of singer songwriter thing, which. Um, Floats around in the early seventies on now. I mean, I mean, an out an artist like you know, Leonard Cohen, for instance, as well as kind of body of of albums, which you know, which are, and songs and so on, which are probably you know, the equal of, of his poems. It is a surprising thing because a modern reader, more to the point, a modern listener, 
they think of all these albums you've just mentioned. They think of, you know, the, the classic albums, even if they don't listen to many albums. If they don't listen to music, they mm. know these albums. And people today, even though this arguably we're living in a more single song driven era, uh, people will, you'll talk about the album album as an art form, as a cohesive whole. And people will say, of course, yeah, of course, that that's what an album can be. But the fascinating thing is you talk about before, before, artists had pioneered that albums were just kind of a were an almost cynical business device to uh, cram some junk and a couple singles and move it out the door as quick as possible well, no certainly i mean i i, I mean that's uh, that's that was phil Spector's uh, take on on the lp before he embraced you know uh the raising guns at uh, leonard cohen or whatever <laughs> else but, uh, <laughs> but um, uh you know and, and recording triple albums with uh, george harrison and working on abbey road um no sorry not um uh, let it be. Sorry, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, it was. I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, Lou Reed, you know, was work, work for a kind of um, in sort of you know this building uh, somewhere outside New York, you know, knocking off uh, you know albums of you know surf music and albums of uh, you know car classics, you know, sub Motown bits and pieces, just you know churning the stuff out for a very kind of kind of less, I suppose, less considerate consumer. Um, so yeah, you do have you know there, uh, you know there will just be you know a couple of hits and then you know the, they'd be forced to you know record you know knock out anything to get an album out just to, to cash in on the on those hits and something like the you know the Beach Boys I think of course something like you know ten albums in about their first three years of of, of existence you know Capital have them you know <laughs> you know cranking out albums at, at an astonishing rate you know and, and um, so you know, you, did, you did have this you know this this earlier era where you know LPs were sort of Considered, I mean, I suppose also, you know, that's another another change in a way. Is that no one really expected this stuff to last in a way that you know that it was felt as being fairly kind of ephemeral, um, you know, and in, in a way that you know the weight of musical history and, and rock pop history sort of places greater weight on on some of these records than anyone thought at the time. You know, they were just going off to make. You know, I mean, people like you know, you know, Frank Sinatra would you know do sort of you know six albums in it. In a year, sometimes um, you know they just go in and you know spend a day recording an album or two. I mean, the first Beatles album, you know, re- literally recorded in in a, in a day, you know, and, and sort of very much kind of knocked off in that kind of expedient way that, that music was. And then you have this you know, sort of a, like coagulation in time and effort with you know the arrival of the sort of late sixties, where bands would you know have to go off to the hills and spend you know weeks recording the drums or you know getting the right vibe and so on. So, yeah. It did seem totally insane and alien and kind of almost wrong to me when I read it, when I saw it laid out there in your book that Sinatra would put out six albums in a year. The Beach Boys would have, you know, three within the span of five months. I was thinking some of my favorite recording artists would be lucky to put out an album every yeah, five yeah. years. I couldn't believe it when, when it was out there. It, it was uh, a different time, I, I suppose, very much so. Well, also, the, you know, what, what happens in a way when the, you know, the LP becomes the, you know, the preferred format of kind of artists as, as well is that the, the sort of a kind of a languor or, you know, a, a whole range of other possibilities starts to come up. Basically, you know, you, you, you'd go away, you know, record the album, and then you would tour the album, uh, you know, and write some new songs, and then, you know, the following year, do the same. It's like a cycle of, of production away, which the LP uh, brought into play, or certainly by the time the LP had become, um, you know, the sort of, Rock and pop format, sort of driving, driving force, you know, in, by the late '60s, uh, and you know, really until fairly recently, that's that sort of still persists. I mean, in a way, that's kind of slowed down. Really, or the whole most bands, you know, uh, contemporary bands don't don't record an album a year anymore. They'll you know, one every one every couple of years, partly I suppose because and, you know, it's now a global thing. So if they tour an album, they tour all around the world with it, rather than maybe just you know a couple of continents or. So you know that that builds in a different a different means of production and um, and promotion and so on and and certainly you know that you know again the iPods and, and you know, iTunes and stuff and the internet has kind of shaken that up a bit in a sense where you know where often your know, albums are you know leaked you know well before um, the release date I mean um, one of my favourite new bands who who actually have recorded a whole album based on someone else's album a band called Dirty Projectors who did an album based on a, a Based on his memory of a, of a Black Flag album, uh, you know their their new album's already been you know, been leaked, and, and you know and the AA, I think the AAAs as well in you know, the kind of contemporary field. You know their album was also leaked before uh, before release date. So you ha- so you know when when in a sense people are much more impatient for the music um, and you know, release this stuff out, uh, 
you know, before it's done, there's a kind of the concept of doing an album rather than just you know, once you've finished a particular song, sticking it out there so people can buy it or listen to it. You know, that, that that's a shift which is kind of happening perhaps as we speak. And what what we've seen in a way is a revival, when, like some other Dirty Objectives album, where uh, you know people were doing, or you know, something like Susan Stevens, for instance, you know, uh, recording you know, albums based on it. On each of the American state, the, the, we've seen sort of a revival of the idea of a conceptual whole, in a sense, to, I suppose, to, say, to provide a reason to buy, you know, to buy to buy the album rather than just downloading a whole track. If, if you you can present it as having, you know, a, a sort of an overarching sort of narrative, which you know you, you don't get, you just take a couple of tracks off of it. Then you know that I think that's certainly become a trend in more recent years. Now, the, the sand is falling fast through the hourglass, but I wanted to ask one last thing. Because your book is, it's of course, it has two titles, depending on the market, the long player, Goodbye, yeah. the vinyl countdown. The vinyl countdown. Yes, it, no, yes. These sound like end, end of an era, you know, watch the clock tick sort of, sort of books, but they are not in any sense laments when, when I read it. There's nothing, it doesn't sound like you are bemoaning the end of anything. Are, are you optimistic about the album format's future? I, I mean, I, I, I have to say, I, the weird thing about it is when I, again, you know, one of the things about writing books, when I first started writing, I was doing the search to write it and so on, I was more pessimistic. You know, I, I genuinely felt that probably, you know, it would go. But actually, you know, um, it does seem to be hanging in. And also, that, you know, that when I started doing it as well, the vinyl, uh, you know, the vinyl revival was still relatively in its infamous. I mean, it's probably, still, it's probably, you know, muddling under, but, you know, but the sales of stuff, were, you know, were... were Picking up, but you know, what nowhere near as much as it became. I mean, I make a comment in the book. You know, that I go into you know, record shops in, in central London now, um, and you know, and, and also when I visit the states as well, and you know, and find you know, rows of rows of new records. You know, in a, in a way that you know, ten years ago, some of those record shops would only have you know, like a very small section of, uh, of vinyl vinyl records, you know, and, and it would all be CDs. So I, that, you know, that certainly changed. Um, I am, you know, I'm fairly optimistic. I mean, I, I think. I think that you know that that urge, in a sense, to sort of um, submerge yourself in, in, in you know in someone else's world, which lasts longer than than just one three minute song. So you have this you know this mood thing. You have some thing bigger than yourself in a way. I don't think that that's gone gone away. And, and as, I, as I as I said just a few minutes ago, I think also that a slight revival in you know people artists producing albums with a kind of conceptual thing, whether that's just a marketing ploy. Um, you know, it's perhaps a more cynical interpretation of it, but um, but no, I am I am fairly. I mean, you know, Bob Dylan's just had you know um, a number one album. You know, the oldest person to to have one. So there's you know there's still clearly life in the format. As long as people want, want to produce them, honestly, want to, to buy them, I suspect that the bigger problem in a way is how you make that pay anymore, um, and you know, and whether if people aren't prepared to pay for music, you know, how, whether you know, um, in a way, the whole point about the LP was that it was you know. The sort of motor, in a sense, of production of, of of popular music for so long, whether that breaks down, whether it you know it makes more sense just to release in individual individual tracks. A musician friend of mine fairly recently, um, sort of uh, his, his label, which is an American label, said that you know from next year then they're stopping producing any physical objects; they're just purely going to sort of downloads. And they themselves, as a record company, have had that sort of rather existential sense of crisis in a way about what are they are you know are they in, a, in effect a, a sort of publicity machine rather than a than a, than a record label now by by you know by that thing and so yeah, that certainly changed but no I, I mean I, I hope the book isn't pessimistic I mean it's, it's I think it's largely a you know a celebra- celebration of of what you know, vinyl records have, have given us over, over the years and, and how they have shaped so much of our you know, our, our sort of ways of thinking about the world and music and and also in even just kind of visually and so on. I mean, you know, how how you know some of the f- fantastic art design, you know, uh, you know, surrealist art, you know, sort of, uh, people, you know, men shaking hands are on fire and so on. You know, <laughs> these first exposures to these kind of art concepts, you know, within a commercial format, um, you know, as a means of commerce. But I think you know they're they're just beautiful objects, beautifully designed that sound wonderful, that put you know all this sort of emotionally engaging and you know meant to be entertaining stuff before us. So I think, I hope the book is, you know, is more of a, a reminder of how much good stuff there is out there, or how much bad stuff even there is out there, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, just as a, you know, as a, a you know, as a reflection of, of ourselves and, how, and what, you know, what changes we've all gone through over the last 60 years and, um, you know, we'll still be going through. 
uh, you know, as I say, you know, who knows, uh, you know, what the future holds. You know, a whole generation of people are coming on board now who, you know, have only ever known the, the internet, um, and, you know, and, and aren't used to the idea of having to, you know, wait for a, for a record to be released or, you know, having to head into town to go and buy it, you know, and, and then wait and get it home and stick it on the turntable in order to hear it for the first time. All of that has has, has changed uh, in a, in a very, you know space of time but I did I'm yeah I'm pretty optimistic on the whole I mean we'll, I think the thing is we'll, we'll all still want music of some kind or another um, and people still want to create music I mean yeah that's the other thing in a way is that uh, we're perhaps you know less passive um, in a way the, the idea of making an album to myself when I was growing up as a teenager seemed sort of a rather a largely impossible dream whereas you know, now all of us in a way can you know Maybe maybe terrible, but we can you know, record something on our computers, you know, and have you know, and design a cover for it, you know, using our computers as well, and have you know, something that relatively few people had the chance to do prior to that. And I, I hear this as I record this very show, in fact, on a computer, the likes of which anybody can buy. The uh, title of the book, once more, in the United States at least, is The Vinyl Countdown, the album from LP to iPod and back again. Travis Elbro, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the program. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Colin. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. As always, our music is produced by Ben Althaus. Hear more of what he's up to at benalthaus.com. Find our complete Marketplace of Ideas interview archive and more on our website, colinmarshallradio.com. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.